Morning, Freedom Church. It's good to be with you. Um, I'm wondering if you're as uh, confused about the weather as I am. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to dress for wintertime, for springtime, uh, or for the fall, or what's going on. So I have on a sweater. I told uh, my mother-in-law I'll probably regret that by this afternoon, because uh, it'll probably be about 85 degrees. Um, but good to be with you. I'm getting some feedback. You guys got me? Okay. Um, good to be with you. Excited to continue this series, We Are Freedom. Uh, and kind of marching through our church covenant. So if you're new, again, welcome. My name's Clint, lead pastor, one of the elders. Uh, But we're walking through this covenant together as a means of saying, what is it that unites us? What is it that makes us a church? What have we committed to? What have we promised? What have we covenanted to God and to one another as a faith family? Uh, And so we're just walking through our covenant, kind of dealing with uh, the texts and topics uh, that that our covenant uh, unites us around. So excited to do that. We'll be in a couple different passages this morning, uh, and so you'll, you'll, you'll flip around with us uh, as we do that. I want to start, though, by asking, um, and I, well, telling you about a TV show that I've watched on Netflix that I wouldn't necessarily commend to everybody uh, to watch, all right? So it's one of those things where it's like, you're a preacher, are you allowed to watch this show or not? I'm not sure, and so I'm, I'm kind of out here right now. And, uh, and, and, uh, and hoping I don't get judged too harshly. And I'm not committing anybody to watch it. But this show, uh, some of you maybe have heard, called Last Chance You. And what this show is about is really, really foul languages. So again, I wouldn't commend anybody to watch it necessarily. But what this show is about uh, are athletes who either had no other hope because uh, they, they, they failed out of college, maybe got in trouble at a school, got kicked out, um, run into some trouble. And, uh, and there's this little bitty uh, school uh, literally in a town of 746 people or something like that, uh, in the middle of nowhere down south, uh, I think it was in Alabama maybe, um, and uh, maybe in Arkansas, I can't remember, somewhere down south, and just this tiny little town, middle of nowhere, this, this junior college who says, you know what, we're going to go after these athletes who have failed out of school, who have gotten in trouble, who have no other hope, and, uh, and we're going to try to get them in this program keep them playing ball, and we're going to work with them the best we can to keep them eligible with one or two years work to get them where they can get back, hopefully, to play D1 football. And uh, and they call it Last Chance U, again, because a lot of these kids have have come from terrible situations, hard home lives, have gotten themselves into some kind of trouble. And so uh, in many ways, if they don't make it at this uh, university, this college, this JUCO, they have no hope for any kind of future other than going back home uh, for most of them uh, to the trouble that kind of got them there to begin with. And so they call it Last Chance You. I was, I was, Rachel and I watched the first episode, and then immediately the old football player in me loved it because you, get, you go back into the locker room, right? And so, uh, again, if, if you're not comfortable with locker room talk, um, don't, don't watch it. Uh, but the coach is cussing everybody, and, and you know, people are responding. And then there's this female character who is... Um, who, who reminds me of the character from the movie Blindside, uh, Sandra Bullock's character in the movie Blindside, but, like, but she's real life, right? And so she's working with this kid, these kids. She's trying to make sure to get them eligible. So literally she's like a mom to everybody on the team. So she goes to class the first day. She looks in to see where they're at in the classroom. Are they sitting there? Do they have pencils? Do they have their notebooks? She calls them out of the class. Do you have a notebook? No. Here, here's your pencil. Sit up at the front of the class. Don't sit. Like, so literally she's kind of the mother uh, to all these players. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch this coach who says, you know what? I want to take these kids who have no hope, who most people have cast aside as not worth investing in. And this woman who's saying, you know what? I'll do everything I can for them stand in place for them to help them get eligible. And we only get them for a year or two. And then hopefully we'll get them to D1 and kind of redeem uh, their story and, and give them a better future than what they have. And, uh, and so we we're watching this story. Rachel and I were watching this scenario in this uh, real life setting. It reminds me again of, of why I love football so much. And much of that is because you see on a football team different coaches using different talents and abilities to help this team of people who in some ways don't belong together and are somewhat misfits, come from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of stories, have all kinds of pain, but these leaders who are saying, we want to help you be successful. That's what we saw on the show. And then I started thinking about this morning as we continue this, what are we as a church? But a group of people who in many ways are misfits, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of stories, all kinds of wounds, all kinds of victories. And we know that apart from Christ in our sin as Christians, we had no hope. Like Christ is our last chance you. If Christ doesn't save us and offer us eternity, we have no hope for eternity. 
And so I just started thinking about the relationship between, between that coach, between the lady working with the players, those players underneath that leadership. And then I thought about this morning as we came to uh, the part of our church covenant, we're going to talk about in letter D in our covenant, just says, we submit to the leadership of our church. And I started thinking about how a church is healthy in as much as healthy members submit to healthy elders. So as go the leaders, so goes the church. As goes any organization, so goes the church. As go though that organization, last chance you, that team, so, so as goes the leadership, so goes the team. And so they've won all these championships and the divisions they're in, and they're getting kids scholarships, and I think even one, I think, has made it to the NFL. And so I started thinking about this and, and thinking about our uh, relationship together as elders and as members of this church. And so the main point this morning that I just want to summarize and show you in Scripture, by the grace of God, Freedom Church will continue to be a healthy and growing church as long as faithful members continue to submit to faithful leaders. So a church, our church will continue to grow, Lord willing, by his grace, by the power of his spirit. As long as our members are growing, healthy members, submitting to growing, healthy elders in our church. So if you want a title, Submission on Mission, Faithful Leaders and Faithful Followers in the Church. So we're going to look this morning at what does it look like for the church to submit to her leaders. So let me pray, and, uh, and then we'll continue on. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your church. We thank you for leaders in your church. God, I thank you for every elder at this uh, this church that serves uh, so tirelessly, especially for those guys who are lay elders who work full-time jobs, uh, and then of their free hours and, and free time uh, give so sacrificially to this church. I thank you for the faithful members of this church. God, I was just telling uh, some brothers a few minutes ago, um, I, I know probably I'm biased, but I, I really do believe, um, God, this is the, the, the easiest and most pleasant church to pastor um, that exists that I've ever heard of. Uh, very few kind of complaints or frustrations or conflicts uh, that I experience as, as a lead pastor. Um, but we do pray, would you continue to help us be healthy? Help us have healthy elders leading, healthy, me healthy members following Christ, that you might get much glory, uh, that your fame would spread, that our church would be healthy, and that she would continue to multiply and bear much fruit in our city and to the ends of the earth. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's kind of walk through again. The, the letter we're talking about this morning is, is talking about submitting to leadership. Uh, but I want to kind of run through first uh, what elders are kind of uh, at, at, at this first portion, what it looks like for elders to be faithful, and then therefore what it looks like for you guys uh, as members of our church and even the elders as also as members to submit to the leadership of the elders. So first point this morning, elders are a gift from God for the good of the church. So if you've got your Bibles, flip to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we'll be in verse 11 to 16. Elders are a gift from God for the good of the church. Now, uh, as you're flipping there, just for the sake of our visitors, uh, or just because, you know, we tend to be uh, leaky and we forget things we knew uh, in the past, I want a few reminders before we jump into the text. First, elder is the term most used in the New Testament to describe the office of pastor or elder. Elder is the most commonly used term in the New Testament. So we're used to saying pastor, or many of us, if we're honest, are used to saying preacher. Okay, the word preacher is never used to describe this office in the, in the Bible, all right? That's a cultural thing, not a Bible thing. So preaching is something that pastors do or something that elders do. Uh, but the office itself, the most common term in the New Testament is the word elder. Also to remind you, in the New Testament, elders, bishops, pastors, these are interchangeable terms to talk about one office, all right? So some of you come from traditions that maybe have a hierarchical structure, uh, there's an elder, then there's a pastor, then there's a bishop. Well, in the New Testament, that's not the assumption of the New Testament. These terms are used interchangeably to talk about one role. So an elder is a pastor, is a bishop. It's, talk, that's, it's one role. Now, I don't want you to just believe that. I want you to see it in Scripture uh, just, again, by way of reminder. Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul gathers together this group of um, leaders. We'll just call them leaders right now. In Ephesus, leaders of the church, he gathers them together. Acts chapter 20, Look, listen to what he says. It'll be on the board. <coughs> Excuse me. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders, presbyteros. You may have heard Presbyterian. He called the elders, that, that word in Greek is, is presbyteros, presbyteroi uh, in, in, in plural form. He gets together the elders of the church to come to him. Verse 18. And when they came to them, he said to them, all right? So he gathers all the elders of the church in Ephesus together. And then he gives this unbelievable message that we'll read in, in its entirety in just a little bit. But for now, skip down uh, to verse um, 28. And listen to what he says to him, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers 
All right, episkopos, episkopoi in, in, in plural. So there's the second word. So that's where you'd hear maybe the Episcopal church, overseer, right? So he gets the elders together, the presbyteroi, he gets those guys together, and he tells those guys, be careful with this flock, pay careful attention to the ones who the Holy Spirit has made you bishops or overseers over this church to care for, and then he said, he goes on, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood, to care, Greek word, uh, I can't say it right, poimen, essentially, something like that, close, but it, it, it's the verb form of the word pastor, right, so he gets one group of guys together, the elders, he says, pay careful attention to those who you are bishops over, make sure you pastor them well, talking about one group of people, right, so I just want you to see, Paul uses these terms interchangeably. One group of guys calls them elders, calls them bishops, calls them pastors, or tells them to pastor all in one section. So in the New Testament, the assumption is uh, that these terms are interchangeable. <clears throat> Secondly, real quick, in the assumption, the New Testament, the, the assumption is there's a plurality of these men. So in Acts chapter 14, verse 23, you don't have to flip there, um, but as Paul's planting new churches, it literally says when they had appointed elders, plural, for them in every church, singular, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So they plant new churches and they appoint elders, plural, in every church, singular, right? So the, the, the assumption is elder, pastor, bishop, interchangeable office, and there are a, a number of those guys in every single church plant that we see in Acts. Or James chapter 5, verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders, plural, of the church, singular, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, all right? So just by way of reminder, Pastor, elder, bishop, same thing. Every church, the assumption of the New Testament has a, a number of these guys leading that church. And so th this is just the assumption of the New Testament. And now what I want you to see that these are a gift from God to the church for the church's good. We're talking about authority. And often in our culture, authority has kind of a bad, bad rap to it, right? We don't like authority in our culture. Why? Because we live in a, in a, in a, a moralistic, kind of relativistic culture that says what's true for you is true for you, what's true for me is true for me. Secular humanism has at its core, we don't like authority. I want to be my own authority and you be your own authority. This is the cultural kind of moment we're in, right? So in, when we hear about authority, our first response is usually like, ah, we don't, we don't like authority because we want to be our own authority. But this, this is not the first sin of our first parents, right? You'll be like God knowing good and evil if you eat the fruit of this tree. You'll be like him. You'll be your own authority. You won't have to submit to him. And so we come and we start think, talking about the word submit and thinking about elders. The fundamental reflex in an, kind of our atheistic worldview culture is that authority is inherently bad. But this is garbage biblically. In the scriptures, authority is inherently good. Inherently it's good because God is the authority and he's a good one. He leverages his authority perfectly. And then he puts people in places of authority in order to leverage his good authority perfectly for his means and his purposes. So authority inherently is good. Now, I'm not saying in this broken world that authority is not used and abused terribly for terrible and wicked evils, right? It is true that happens. But inherently, we need to know authority is inherently good because God is authority, <laughs> And we are subjects, and to submit to a good authority is good and for our blessing. So you need to know it's inherently good. It's only bad when it's used wrongly. So let's see how this authority given to pastors is a gift to the church. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Apostle Paul says, and he gave. So there's your word gift, all right? So, and he gave. God gave. This is a gift. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds. So there's our word pastor. Pastors, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, and from the whole body joined and held together by every joint, with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So I just want you to notice a few things about what, what God says, what Paul says right here about what an elder or pastor is. So first he says they're given to the church. God gives leaders to the church. And then he tells us why. He says to equip saints for the work of ministry. And then just listen to some of these phrases. For the building up of the body. 
so that we might attain unity of faith, that we might attain knowledge of the Son of God, that we might grow to maturity, that we might no longer be childlike so we get tossed to and fro by waves of every wind and doctrine, so that we understand when a, a movie with whack doctrine like the shack comes out that this is heretical. So we don't want to be tossed to and fro and think, oh, but it's warm and fuzzy and feels good. That's fine. It's just heretical. And so he says, the, the elders are given to the church so that we're not tossed to, to and fro and we can discern things that are wrong. We want to be a community that speaks the truth in love. Community that's growing up into the mature body of Christ with Christ as our head or as our authority. And when this body, notice, when this body is equipped properly, then it grows and builds itself into a community that literally builds more love in the community. So first thing you need to see, elders or pastors or bishops are given by God to the church for the church's good. It's a gift from God. This office is for our good. And so we have spiritual authorities given to us so that we might grow in unity, that we might grow in our knowledge and understanding of Christ, that we might grow in our knowledge and understanding to discern false doctrine from true doctrine, that we might learn and become this community that loves and serves and builds each other up into the full measure of Christ. We sanctify and encourage and build one another in Christ. And so when we think about uh, uh, wrongly about what this is, and th this might be a little uncomfortable, um, but I think it's helpful. All too often we think wrongly that a pastor is the hired hand that we pick to do the work of ministry. So we think like Americans and demo like in a democratic society where we select the guy we want to do the work. And so we hired a preacher to do the work of ministry. Now what's the problem with that? Is that what the text says the, the preacher is? <laughs> no, we hire Actually, we receive the gift that God gives to us in order to equip us to do the work of ministry. So we don't vote the man who does the work that we want to be in place. God gives us the man to equip us to do the work God wants us to do. And so we think wrongly often about what leadership in the church is and, and how we even should think about submitting to this leadership. The pastor is not a hired hand to do the work of ministry. He's a gift from God to equip you to do work of ministry. So elders lead by equipping the church with truth in love for the sake of a love-building community. So I just want, before we, we go further, I just want you to see pastors and lay elders. And I, and I just, Freedom, again, Freedom Church, you are blessed with just wonderful elders and pastors. I mean, I literally, I, if it weren't for protecting other people's personal information, I would let any of you sit in on an elders meeting. And I promise you would feel like I'm safe with the leadership of these men. They protect how they even talk about me in my worst state, in the worst moments, even to each other. Nothing leaks out from among the table about those scenarios. These men are gifts to this church for our spiritual good that we might build each other up in unity to the glory of God and equipping us to reach our city. There are new Christians in the room right now because you have led them to Christ. Because your pastors have taught you the scriptures and how to do that. And this is what it looks like to receive God. Elders are a good gift from God for the good of the church. He gives leaders to us for our good, for the gospel's advance, and for the flourishing of his church. So I ask just by way of application from point one, would you please pray for this process as we're seeking to discern some new potential future elders of this church? There are, there are a number of, uh, of men in this church that I think can be elders and will be elders in the future. I'm excited about this process, uh, but we're in process right now. And so we just ask, Freedom Church, as a faithful covenant member of this body, if you're a member here, please be praying for that process. Lord, give us new elders. It's up to you. They're gifts that you give to us. Would you give us some new elders? And, and just in this, understand, we, don't, we, we recognize and receive new elders and pastors as gifts rather than people we picked. So the result of, of this scenario is not from a democracy, but honestly, it's like from a benevolent dictator, right, God. So he's the one who gives the gifts. So we have the elders he gives to us, and we receive those as gifts. So pray that God would give us more faithful elders to lead our church. So first, elders are gifts from God for the good of the church. Secondly, elders then, therefore, should lead faithfully. So, so elders are gifts from God given to his church. Pastors are gifts from God given for the good of his church. And therefore, elders should lead faithfully. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 5. So Peter writes, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ 
as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what do we see about this? First, Peter starts and says, shepherd the flock of God among you. This is the first exhortation to the elders. But I want you to notice when he first came to them, he said, hey, as a fellow, as a fellow elder. This is an amazing statement. This is Peter, spent three years with Christ, who denied Christ, who was restored to Christ. And then he writes this letter and he says, hey, elders, I'm, gonna, hey, I'm just a fellow elder. <laughs> this is this apostle Peter. He saw the resurrected Lord. He was with him. Spent time with him, was restored to him after rejecting him. And he says, I'm, look, I'm just one of the guys. And so before we can even get to the exhortations, elders, future elders, future pastors, church planters, understand the apostle Peter says, I'm just one of the guys. So those who are elders, before we move forward, brothers, let us not forget, we're just one of the guys. God gave us his gifts to this church, but he's the one that did the choosing and the giving, not us. We're just one of the guys. Right, and so the Apostle Peter says this, but then he tells him, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Elders are called to lead the church. Lead those people who say, I covenant with this body to submit to your leadership. And then Peter says, and you shepherd the flock of God that's among you. We don't shepherd the flock of God at churches around. We shepherd this flock that God has given us. So God, you gave us to them, and you gave them to us to shepherd so this is all about God's work and doing. And so he says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Those who've covenant to be underneath your leadership and to follow your leadership. And then he begins to describe what that's like, exercising oversight. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. What's he saying? He's saying, lead with love for the sheep. Not to have power over the sheep. Not to gain recognition. Not to gain status. Not for any other reason, but you love the sheep. So if you're going to lead God's flock, he says, you don't do this domineering over them. You're not, like power-hungry pastors are, that, like that's an oxymoron. You don't get it. You're not here to, to exercise dominance and, and lord over people. No, we do this willingly, not under compulsion. Nobody twists our arms into this. The Spirit of God grips our hearts and grabs us and sends us into it. But he says, you do this. Not, not, you're, not, you're not doing this. You're not domineering over the flock. You're treating sheep like sheep. You're loving them, you're caring for them, you're feeding them, you're, you're protecting them from wolves, you're protecting them from false teaching, you're protecting them from going astray, you're protecting them from themselves, you're feeding them with the nourishment of God's word. You're leading them in the direction they should go, you're equipping them to do the work God has called them to do. And so he says, this we, we lead and we shepherd out of love, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So as you lead as, a, as an under shepherd, as a pastor, as an elder, he says, you do this as an example. So we lead by preaching and teaching God's word, but we must be examples to follow. So I just sat in Sunday school talking with a couple of brothers about what it means to be a shepherd, what it means to be a pastor. And it's difficult. We sit around those table, the, the, you know, right now, the, the seven of us, and, and, and we sit there knowing our flaws. It's like, man, the weightiness of <laughs> we have to be an example for you to follow, that's a weight. It's like, all right, Lord, is my marriage an example? Is my parenting an example? Is my grandparenting an example? Is my, how I engage myself at work an example? Is my evangelism an example? Is my Bible study an example? Is my prayer life an example? Is my willingness to go an example? Is, is, is my giving financially an example? Can everybody look, like we're volunteering to be in a fishbowl and say you can watch my life as an example to follow. So he says you teach the word, but then you volunteer to be in the fishbowl to let people watch your life as an example. Now, this doesn't mean the shepherds or the elders are, are, have to be perfect or are perfect. Every guy in here who's a pastor or elder would laugh at you if you said he was the perfect example to follow. They would immediately quit. So please don't say that or think that. Right? So what does it also mean? It means that the elders among the flock must be the chief repenters in the flock. We're the first ones to be convicted of sin, to confess our sin, to flee from our sin, to remind ourselves of the gospel, and to trust in Christ and Christ alone to shepherd this church. We're not the ones who figured it all out. We're the ones who figured out that we haven't figured it all out and that we need the one who has, namely Christ. <laughs> and we're just willing to do that in front of you. 
willing to make mistakes in front of you and to return to Christ in front of you so that you know what it looks like when you're convicted of sin and you've made a mistake, how to flee to Christ. So he says, we don't lord over you like we're better than you. We're not. We're just like you. <laughs> now, the Lord has qualified us, so our character, again, is exemplary in that there's nothing, nothing shady. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, must be above reproach. You know, like, and then all that means, we don't use that phrase above reproach. He can't be a sketch ball. <laughs> like, that's probably a healthy translation for today, right? He can't be a sketch ball. You can't, like, an elder can't be the dude when somebody says, that guy's a pastor. It's like, that guy's a pastor? <laughs> okay, that guy doesn't need to be a pastor. <laughs> if that's people's response, no. So there, there is a place where your character needs to be above reproach and, can be, and people can follow it as an example. That's, that's what it looks like to be a Christian. But many times it looks like, okay, we're the chief repenters. We display what it looks like to make mistakes and return to Christ. And we do this with the great hope of verse four. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Chief shepherd, let me give you another translation of that. Senior pastor. So I'm a little obnoxious about this, I admit. So I like lead pastor title rather than senior pastor. And this verse is why. So when the chief shepherd appears, it's like, we want to be real clear, and I'm, people aren't sinful for using the title senior pastor. That's okay. I'm just letting like, you know it's my preference. I just want to be real clear. Hey, I might, my job might be to lead this church, but let's be real clear. There's one senior pastor of this church forever, and it's not me. It's the Lord Jesus. And he will appear with an unfading crown of glory for every pastor, elder, shepherd, bishop who says, I will serve as an example. I'll live in the fishbowl. I'll make, it, I'll make mistakes in front of them. I'll be the chief repenter. I'll teach them God's word. I'll suffer with them. And Jesus says, I'm coming back for my sheep and all of my under shepherds who've been faithful. There's an unfading crown of glory. I promise it's worth it. And so we anticipate and we hope that. And even as I was talking to one brother, so our job as, as under shepherds is to point to this chief shepherd. We let you know, hey, come follow me as I follow him. Like, don't follow me as an end. That's a bad place for you to go. <laughs> like, you follow me as I'm following Christ. This is what Paul says in Corinthians, right? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Because we're pointing to this one. So it's like, come here, let me show you him. We pour into you by pointing to Christ. We point you to this chief shepherd. And this is what Paul says the elder does. And so then he says, verse 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Submit to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, elders and members. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but give grace to the humble. In this conversation with a couple of brothers right now, just praying about would God call them to this work. I said to him, honestly, the chief virtue for being a pastor, chief virtue for being an elder is humility. Like you fundamentally, you've got to admit, I don't know all the answers. I don't know how to fix all the problems. I don't know how to do everything I'm supposed to do. I am not perfect, but I know the one who is. I know the one who does. I know the one who knows all the answers. And I will point people to him with all that I have. Right? And so this is, so all of us have this humility. We create this culture of humility. All right? So God gives pastors as a good gift. I want to show you this in the example of the Apostle Paul back in Acts chapter 20. I just want you to this, this passage is dripping with passion and love for Christ and passion and love for his church. And for the elders in the room, for potential future aspiring elders one day, for wives of men who need to be elders, for single ladies looking for what kind of man should I marry, for young single men thinking, oh, what kind of man should I be? Paul captures, like it's like, Lord, make us like this. Make us have this kind of heart. Make us have this kind of clear conscience before God. Make us have this kind of commitment to God's word. Make us have this kind of sacrificial love. Make us shed these kinds of tears because of love for God and love for God's mission. Acts 20, let's read it together. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plot of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. Testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of, them, 
none of you among whom I've gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day, I'm innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So for Paul, he knows this precious people. He says, elders, you guys take care of because Christ himself lived for them. He died for them on the cross. He took their sins upon himself. He drank the wrath of almighty God for their sins. And he went to the grave. He resurrected from the grave. They repented. They trusted in him. He bought this bride with his blood. And so this is what drives Paul's passion. So he continues. He, and he tells those elders, you pay careful attention. Why? Because verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I've shown that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because he had spoken, the word he had spoken that they should not see his face again and they accompanied to him to the ship. <laughs> This is, what, this is what kind of pastors and elders you want to be praying to shepherd this church. This is what kind of pastors and elders we want to send out to Convergence Church in, in Concord. This is the kind of men, single ladies, you want to be looking for. This is the kind of men, single men, you want to be. Elders, this is what we're called to. We love God's word. We don't shrink back. We'll teach all of it. We're not scared of any part of it. Even if it offends people, it's like we don't want to be offensive. We understand the gospel is, so we'll do everything we can for us not to be offensive, though we understand this message will be offensive. And so we don't shrink back. We preach it and teach it with tears, with prayer, with fasting, in public and in homes, in private. We love and we shepherd the flock and we trust God to advance this gospel. This is what Paul models for us. Church, there's a couple applications here. Pray for your elders and pastors to be faithful men like this and pray for more men to be raised up like this. But visitors and non-Christians, if you're looking for a church, look for a church led by men like this. That needs to be the number one thing you say is the word of God, God taught properly by faithful elders or pastors. That's got to be your number one priority. I don't care if you don't like the music. I don't care if you don't like the seats. I don't care if you don't like the people. Is God's word there? Are they led by faithful leaders? Figure out how to like the rest of it because these are the things that matter most. This is what I would encourage you to do. I went on a little bit of a Twitter tirade earlier this week, and a number of people sent me some messages. And I was just reading a couple of things, studying, I was getting rocked off of Galatians and about to have the, uh, uh, the Bible study in degree with Galatians. So if you see a church where the pastor acts like a celebrity, and then he uses that celebrity to gain more power and leverage and comfort and all the things he wants, just run away from that church as fast as you can. Churches aren't led by celebrities. Or they're led by the celebrity. His name's Jesus, but he doesn't act like a celebrity the way our celebrities act. Right? He washes feet. He dies for his enemies. Like, so if you find churches that literally kind of put the most gifted guy up and treat him like a celebrity and like he's somehow better than, he's the holy man, he's, just run from those churches. What, what you want are faithful elders leading faithfully and then preaching sermons such that you're blown away not by the sermon but by the savior of the sermon. Right? So you don't want sermons that you're like, yo, he's so good at yada, yada, yada. Who cares? Who cares if you still go to hell? You want sermons that point you to the Christ that you can worship forever. That's what you need. And so find and prioritize faithful churches that are faithful with God's word, that are led by faithful men. Spurgeon says, if you meet with a system of theology which magnifies man, flee from it as far as you can. Again, elders are a gift from God for the good of the church. They should lead faithfully. But the main section of our covenant is about you and your responsibility as a church to submit to this kind of leadership. Point three. Lastly, faithful members submit to faithful elders. So faithful members submit to faithful elders. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. The writer of Hebrews says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have, who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. I want to give you three just quick observations, kind of exhortations from this text. You need to trust your elders you need to submit to your elders and you need to encourage your elders. 
And again, elders, pastors, same thing. So trust your pastors, submit to your pastors, encourage your pastors. First, trust. So he says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Now we read it in English and it feels like that's two ways of saying the same thing. Obey your leaders, submit to them. That's the same thing. Writer of Hebrews, what do you mean by that? In Greek, so one commentator, O'Brien, helped, is very helpful in clarifying the difference between the two words. He says this, the first verb means to put, your, put one's trust in someone, while the second one, which occurs only here in the New Testament, is stronger and means to give way, to yield, or to submit to someone. So this first word, obey, in Greek conveys a meaning of you should trust them, like entrust yourself to their authority. So the second one's going to be submit to it, but the first one is you should trust their leadership. This is, this is what you should do. Now, we're in a contentious culture that's always looking for a fight about everything, especially on Facebook, right? So you get on Facebook, and people are just like, I mean, you, I just start scrolling down, and literally, this is what I feel like. I, you, people are just ready to fight. And so they're just waiting for you. Say something stupid. I got you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can just tell. It's like, and it doesn't matter what you say on which side of whatever issue. You're going to get attacked. They're, they're, they're violent. They'll, they will come after you, right? So this is, this is the way we think about relating uh, to people and, def- and, and arguing and fighting over conflict. But friends, first he says, don't, don't think like that. Don't be sitting on Facebook waiting for somebody to say something wrong that you disagree with. Don't relate to your pastors like that. Don't relate to your elders who are leading your church, wondering and waiting for them to say something wrong that you're ready to fight with. Don't approach it like that, even in your own mind and behind closed doors. Give benefit of doubt as the default. Assume the best of everything they would say or do by default. Now, it's okay. I'm not saying don't have questions. I'm not even saying don't disagree. I'm just saying let your posture be one that says, I trust these men to lead our church. God has given them to our church. I've been in that process. I've agreed with that. I haven't pushed back on that in any way, shape, or form. I've had the opportunity to if I wanted to. I believe this is God's gift to our church, so I trust them. And so if I hear something, I'm like, "Ah, I don't know how that sits with me. I'm just going to assume I would understand if I go sit with them. And if I need to, because I have a question of disagreement, I'll go sit with them. But I'm going assuming by the end of it we're going to agree. I'm not going like I do to Facebook, ready to fight and defend my position. Right? He's like, no, obey your leaders. Trust them. Trust they have your best in mind. Again, it's okay to have the, the disagreements. That will happen. We're in a broken world and our elders aren't perfect. Even the collective group of elders aren't perfect and make mistakes. We've done that before and we've apologized to you <laughs> for those mistakes. So it's fine, again, to have the questions uh, and even potentially disagreements, but do it in such a way that's assuming the best and assuming you will agree uh, once you can talk. And I, and I, and I want to be, I'm not just trying to help the pastors and elders at Freedom as I, as I say some of this. I'm trying to help you out as well. You know, um, at the end of this verse, I mean, he states very explicitly, um, like it's, it's good for you to, to obey and submit to your leaders, right? It, 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 that's good for you. Um, it's not good for you not to. Um, but I'm also trying to help you out because, look, there's nothing, let's just be honest, and, and let's just be honest. There's nothing more obnoxious than a person who's arrogant in their ignorance, right? There's nothing worse than a person who's really arrogant about something they're wrong about. It's like, how are you so arrogant and so wrong at the same time? Like, don't you understand these things don't go together? <laughs> like, you're, you're looking very proud of being a moron. Like, this is just not a good, it's not a good mixture, right? So I, I feel like in some ways this is the armchair quarterback. I don't know if you ever heard that phrase. Um, you got, some of y'all know, some of you don't. But I played quarterback in high school. And so, um, you, you know, the, the whole armchair quarterback is everybody sitting in the stands or watching football on TV that's telling the quarterback everything he's doing wrong. Oh, you stupid quarterback. That, was, that guy was wide. Why did that? You know, they, they kind of, they, they know clearly what you should do. Though they've never played quarterback. They've never had any experience. They have no idea what it's like to take the snap and have about 78 decisions you've got to make before you take the snap, and then to have two and a half to three seconds while massive people who are taller than you are running at you, and so you can't see anything anyway, and so you have to memorize everything that's happening while you can't see everything. you got two and a half seconds to then make, you've already made the 75 before the snap, now you've got about 13 or 15 different reads and decisions you need to make in the two and a half to three seconds before the massive dude puts you on the ground and you're not sure if you know your last name anymore, Right? <laughs> And so you're watching in the stands like, that dude was wide open. It's like, well, he couldn't see that dude. The dude in front of him was like 18 feet tall. Like, it's easy for you to say, right? So as a quarterback, that's the way you always feel. People in the stands cussing, talking about how terrible you are. And you're like, okay, amen, amen. Like, get back here one time, and I promise it would be the last time you'd ever want to do it, right? So that's the armchair quarterback. It can be very similar in the church, though. So many people in the church can be like, well, a pastor should, da-da-da-da, or the elder should, da-da-da. You don't even know nothing about leading the church. 
You've never done this. So there might be one thing you've seen that you're like, that should have been done better. Well, the problem is that's that one thing you saw. And there's a list of about a thousand things that conversation's fitting into. And so you had no idea any of this was going on as you were thinking about that one thing you saw. And so it's like, so the point was just, just assume the best. The elders are considering these things. Now, that does not mean blindly follow. Please don't hear me saying blindly follow. I'm just saying biblically follow. Assume the best. Assume there's a bazillion things I don't know about as they consider how they're doing this or that and the other that I disagree with. And so I'm going to assume I would agree with them if I had the whole picture. I would probably end up agreeing with them. But if I have questions my soul, I don't think it's best, I will reach out to them and I'll tell them, here's why I'm a little concerned, brother. Help me understand. Oh, okay, cool. Makes sense. I'm good. Or, no, did you think about this? And sometimes in those meetings, we'd be like, oh, wow. Because of these thousand things, we actually didn't think about that. You're right. That's super helpful. Great. Let's change that decision. But do you see how the difference in that, that I'm going to begin with the assumption I trust them? And I trust they're doing the right thing and seeking uh, scriptures and they're trying to obey God. And I want to start there. But not only should trust them, he says you should submit to them. So obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. God has given them as a gift to equip you to do the ministry this church has called you to. So I just want you to know our elders are praying, are studying, are searching scripture, are seeking counsel, are talking to each other, are reading books, we're processing, we're wrestling, we're debating, we're arguing with each other and fighting to discern what's best for you. So we're working very hard to try to help give what's best to you spiritually. Keeping watch, this phrase of Brian says, uh, literally what it means is to, to go to bed sleepless. So like one who keep his wa keeps watch overnight, right? So the elders, he says, Obey them, submit to them as those who are literally sleepless for you. And I would say, this is true. There are nights we don't sleep well because of your broken marriage. There are nights we don't sleep well because you don't know how to pay your bills. There are nights we don't sleep well because you found out you've got this deep wound from your childhood. There are nights we don't sleep well because you're foolishly running to sin again and again and again. There are nights we don't, nights we don't sleep well because you're addicted to pornography and you're destroying your life and you don't care. There are nights we don't sleep well for all kinds of things because we're giving ourselves to go sleepless in order to shepherd what's best for you. And so this writer says, so submit to that leadership. I just ask you the question, who else on the planet's doing that for you? Who else on planet Earth is studying the Bible, reading books, praying, talking, arguing, debating, thinking about your eternal good? Who else on the planet's doing that for you? And so the writer says, submit to them. God has given them to you for your good. You should obey and submit to them. And, and notice the phrase is those who have to give an account. I want y'all to know the elders at Freedom Church, if no other elders anywhere else feel that verse, we feel it. We're going to stand before God on judgment day and account for how we did this. We feel that. Who else feels that for you? We feel it. And so if you're wrestling with something, you're living in sin, you don't know if you can trust us, that's what we're feeling for you. We love you. We care for you. We love God. We love you. We want your eternal good. We're doing all these things for your eternal good. And so he says, submit and obey to them. Understand and know that. God has called you to submit and obey here. Now, again, to be clear, the elder's authority is clearly a delegated authority, right? It only extends in as much as we faithfully teach and apply the Bible to your life. So I'm not saying just follow us blindly. I'm saying follow us biblically, right? Hebrews uh, chapter 13, just back in verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he says, remember those leaders of your past who taught you the word of God. Consider how that took them, where that took them in their life. Consider, look at their life and where you see their life was teaching the word of God correctly, being an example for the word of God, then I want to imitate that. I want to live that out. And so again, I'm not saying do it without question and blindly. Do not do that. Always be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, right? Paul preaches, explains the gospel. It says they ex examine the scriptures daily to see if what he said was true. So always check what we're saying as we give you advice, as we counsel you, as we lead you. Always measure it by the scriptures. And where we contradict the scriptures, go with the scriptures, not us. Now try to do that humbly. Try to point us out, show us why we're wrong. But if, we, if we've lost our minds and we're going against the Bible, find another church. Do it humbly and gently. So always check what we're saying. But again, in as much as we're teaching the Bible faithfully and trying to help you apply it to your life faithfully, submit and obey to our leadership. Our covenant says we'll seek the guidance of our elders and small groups in major life decisions. 
this caused a little bit of conflict when we went through this as a church four years ago. Um, it's like, wait a minute, I don't, I don't want to talk to my elders or small group leaders about major life decisions. Well, who says I got to do that? So Proverbs eleven fourteen. When there's no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. All the statement is saying, seek the guidance of our elders. It doesn't mean you have to do everything they say. <laughs> it's just saying, no, well, if we have a major life decision, I don't care where you're going for lunch today. So don't ask me what, what should you eat for lunch today. I don't, I, just, you know, be a good steward of your body and, and eat well. Whatever. I don't care about that. That's not what we're talking about. Major life decisions. Should I marry this individual? If the answer is no, should I even be dating this individual? Should I move my family across the country for another job? Should I take this massive promotion? Am I mature enough to handle that much more money? Major life decisions where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counsel, there's safety. We're not telling you to do everything we tell you to do. We're saying don't be a fool. The scriptures tell you to be wise and seek counsel. So we're just saying be wise, seek counsel. Get input from godly people whom you should trust and want to submit to because God's given them to your church and you've covenanted to follow their leadership, right? So you're thinking, man, I might need to transfer or, or leave the church, go to another church. It's like, that's okay. Freedom's not a perfect church. It's not the perfect church for everybody. We get that. But you should reach out to us and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Should I go to a different church? And it's like, oh, let me hear why. Ah, oh, that might actually, sounds like you probably should. That'd be wise. We're like, no, like in order so you can keep living in sin? No, you shouldn't do that. Because <laughs> you're wanting to hide so you can keep sinning? No, you shouldn't do that. You should stay here with us and let us help you through this, right? So again, major life decisions. It's like seek counsel for wisdom and help. So again, God has given elders to, to gift, as a gift to the church for your good. Elders need to be faithful. And then as members, we need to trust them, submit to them, and then lastly, encourage them. He says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pastoring and shepherding is hard work. It is hard work. But man, when we see you guys growing, we see you all encouraging each other, we see you trying to figure out how to share your faith at work, we see you fleeing from sin and fleeing to Christ, we see you wrestling for personal holiness as hard as it is in this culture, especially as a single person, and we see you fighting the good fight of the faith, there's no greater joy than to do this work. And so he says, let them do this with joy. Let them do this. With, like, that's advantage to you. You don't want the pastor showing up. Being, ah, you again? Like, this, like, no, he says, no, submit to them. Obey them. Like, let them do this with joy. It's okay if you're struggling with sin. Welcome to the party. Don't struggle alone. Say, pastor, help me. Help me fight this. I don't want to fight by myself. I love hearing that. Great. Let us help you fight. Right? So he says, let them do this with joy. And so encourage them. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, to esteem them very highly in love because of the work. Be at peace among yourselves. So freedom, I would just say, keep doing this. You guys are great about this. So there's no corrective necessarily. It's like, just keep on doing this. Pastor Josh puts in crazy hours. Bree makes all kinds of sacrifices for him to put in crazy hours, usually doing thankless work that not very many people notice. Keep encouraging them and tell them thank you. Keep letting them know I'm thankful for all the work you're doing for our spiritual good as you oversee our souls. All the lay elders, again, working full-time jobs and having long elders meetings about deep doctrinal things or about difficult issues that our church members are in. Thank them. This church has been, I mean, the Gillens, the Sipes, the Ingles, the Vandals, the Suggs and the, and the Whites. And I, like, we work so hard and it's such a joy, but keep encouraging these elders. Just say, brother, I'm thankful for you, man. Thank the wives. They put up with us. So one, it's like, we're, when we're, we got our own jacked up issues anyway, right? So they got to put up with that anyway, and then they got to make extra sacrifices so we can try to help you with your issues. Thank the wives. Just tell them thank you. Encourage them in this work. In conclusion, by the grace of God, may we all do our part to continue to be a healthy and growing church by being faithful members and submitting to faithful leaders. And we can do all of this because Jesus, the chief shepherd, the senior pastor, he not only gives good pastors to his church, he is our pastor. So he gives us good pastors, but not only that, he gave his life. So when we were at our, our worst, when we weren't obeying him, when we weren't submitting to him, instead when we were running from him, he gave his life to, to live for us so that we would have the right obedience to God that he earned. And then he died on the cross for all of our rebellion and he resurrected so that he could be our senior pastor. 
What a God. So giving the church pastors, that's a great gift. Giving the church himself, <laughs> that's the greatest gift. And so under shepherds, again, it's just one of the guys pointing you to the king who gave himself for us, right? Even when we're at our worst. So let's look to Christ together by being faithful members and faithful shepherds. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, the, the chief shepherd, the senior pastor, who when we were run, run away sinners, flipping you off, excited about being in our sin, you came for us, you lived for us, you died for us, you rose for us, you reigned for us, and you're coming back for us. You are the senior pastor that all of our souls need. You're the perfect shepherd. You know how to correct us when we need to be corrected. You know how to rebuke us when we need to be rebuked. You know how to encourage us when we're discouraged. You know how to strengthen us when we're weak. You know how to use us when we're weak so that we know it was you doing the work. You're the perfect pastor. So we thank you that you give under shepherds uh, to pastor to represent and point to you. May you bless this church and keep raising up faithful shepherds who will shepherd well. And may you give this church a spirit of humility that would gladly trust and submit to and encourage their pastors. And in so doing, would you form a faith family that's so healthy that it's the most effective missional gospel army we could imagine in Lincoln and to the ends of the earth. Humble us all, Lord. We repent of our pride. We repent of our refusal to submit to you because we think we would make a better Lord of our lives. Pray for non-Christians in the room that they would realize that they are rejecting a gracious and kind and compassionate senior pastor who would shepherd them to eternity full of perfect life with you. And instead, they're turning to themselves and saying they're better at life than you are. Pray, forgive them for that. Save them from that. Turn their heart toward you. And pray that all of us would consider how we might be more faithful to submit to you and to one another and even to the leadership of this church. Praise in Jesus' name.